The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy, the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States, and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. And now, Sign Institute 2023 Fellow, Anna Devere Smith. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ava Gadden. I'm the Administrative Assistant for SIGN, um, and I am so proud to welcome our fellow Anna DeVere Smith, playwright, actress, teacher, and author again, and American University alum, Tony-winning Artistic Director for Arena Stage, Molly Smith. Molly, thank you so much for joining us today and for hosting. I couldn't be happier than to be here with Anna. Well, it's my pleasure. I haven't seen you in way too long 10 way years too long probably 10, 10 years, years. Yeah. yeah 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 i'll never forget let me down easy here at arena no. it was brilliant that was a brilliant 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 production I was about a really you. important subject yeah which is what you've been involved in your entire career anna i mean everything that you have touched i'm really curious to start with something which is uh, Twilight, uh, Los Angeles. Um, yeah, I mean, you did this at the taper 30 years ago, and then you've done it again. How was it revisiting it? Well, um, the revisit started with the um, Signature Theater that, as you know, does, uh, they have playwright residencies. And in that time, uh, as the so-called I guess, old playwright, you know, somebody who's been around, um, they do two of your, at least the way it worked with me and Paige is she did two of my works and then I owe her a new work. But um, the first was Fires in the Mirror. She wanted to do Fires in the Mirror and Twilight and we did uh, Fires in the Mirror. And then um, Twilight kept getting postponed because of COVID. But in the midst of COVID, as you well know, in 2020 was the murder of George Floyd which therefore made uh, a certain relevance. Uh, yes, also because of George Floyd happening during COVID uh, made the show uh, unfortunately quite relevant by the time it made it to the stage, uh, which was 2021. Uh, and um, <clears throat> folks in, and it went to the ART and then folks in LA heard about it, came to see it and then wanted to do a production of it in LA as this, you know, would it be a celebration? I don't know. A uh, recognition of 30 years. It was 30 years ago that I performed it mm -hmm. um, as a one person show. Uh, they wanted to use Los Angeles artists only. So sadly for the folks who worked on the New York production, it didn't go there. Um, and that just closed last week. And uh, it's pretty humbling to think that that was 30 years ago that I did the play. And it feels like yesterday. That's incredible. And <clears throat> even though this is the type of work that you've been known for, you now have done an enormous right turn and have moved into writing a libretto for an opera, right? Which yeah. just opened or was running in Chicago. Can you just closed. Yeah. tell us about that and tell us about how the writing process was different for that than for what you did in Twilight? Well, everything was different, and but it's not unrelated to my work. Renee Fleming, uh, everybody so knows who she is, uh, the great soprano, um, had seen my play Notes from the Field about the school-to-prison pipeline, 
and it, which you, you saw part of, I think. Absolutely. Think. Yep. Uh, in New York, um, having seen that, she suggested to me that I write a libretto about gun violence among youth in Chicago. And so uh, my process was very similar. Um, I knew about an organization called Chicago Cred, co-founded by Arnie Duncan and uh, Lorreen Paul Goff. In fact, um, I had been invited to go and see them in 2018 and, and didn't have a chance to. But at any rate, uh, I did interviews of people who were in, involved in gang violence. Arnie's idea, former secretary of education under Obama, is uh, to stop gun violence has worked with the shooters. So a lot of the people who I interviewed were people who had, um, uh, you know, shot somebody, uh, had been incarcerated and came out. And some of them evolved from participants who were revising their lives to people who are actually fundamental to that, that whole staff. And so um, again, I took the job while we were not in COVID, then in COVID, that meant that I, you know, uh, uh, Molly, that I go, I go where I'm doing the interviews and, and, and spend time there and really live in the, you know, live near the community, get to know the people, but I couldn't do that. So I did all of the interviews on Zoom. Um, and then I turned in a libretto, which all my work is always too long when it starts. And the composers, Daniel Romain, uh, Daniel Bernard Romain, called him DBR, Haitian American, and the director, who's been called by um, the New York Times opera's new disruptor, and I uh, then, you know, descended on that very fat script. But the surprise for me, uh, which turned out to be a wonderful surprise, but shocking at first, was when I sent the libretto to the composer, it came back like he just revised it and didn't talk to me. So I was like, oh, really puffy. I talked with Amy about this yesterday. I was all puffed up, you know, what? not even the New York Times changes my work without discussing it with me. And, you know, of course, with a play, nobody can change a word. And uh, Yuval, to his credit, um, who's a brilliant, brilliant collaborator, uh, just really wants to get to yes with everybody, you know, came and saw me in New York and sat down and said, I don't agree with it, but the way opera works is it's all about the composer. And of course, if we start thinking of the operas that we know, you, you don't know who's the librettist of Carmen. You don't know, right? I mean, you don't know who the librettist is. You do know who the composer is. So it's the composer's work. But I, um, and Molly, you know, I have a lot of control uh, over the, the work that I do because usually I've been out there. Sometimes I've been in dangerous places by the time I come back and I function also like a producer really of the work, but this was a very different situation where um, uh, I was technically, I suppose, in a backseat, but because of the chemistry between the three of us, we were really joined at the hip. And I have to say, it's one of, one of the best collaborations I've ever had in my life. How was it for you working through one of your pieces that was also driven by music? How did that change your, your just, writer's brain? I loved it so much because Daniel really, you know, he heard the music and the language, right? That was not a thing that had to be discussed at length. He heard the music and the language. And so, and interestingly enough, I did a little experiment um, when I made a speech about two weeks ago, uh, having heard this music for two years, um, one of the two of the characters, um, I like spoke at a speech for the first time. And I can only think of them now with the music in my mind. Yeah. Which is really interesting. I always carry the music of the speaking because that's what I'm looking for, as you know. But now I, I cannot. And one of them in particular, one interview in particular, he really, he took word for word, you know, just like me. And I cannot read that, think of that without hearing Daniel's music in my mind. You know, I'm so curious to see or hear uh, this opera, Anna, because I believe we haven't found the right way within our field, and I would open it up to opera, to really talk about gun violence in such a way that people hear it. 
and are moved by it and the right people are moved by it if there are right people to be moved by it because that it's it's just a really difficult um part of how do you communicate with people about this epidemic that we're going through and how do you communicate with people in such a way that suddenly their minds are going to be formed in a different way. Uh, somebody's just asking, where can those of us outside of Chicago see this performed? And I um, would assume. I, yeah. Well, they do have some streamed versions of it, but it's highly controlled. I imagine if you contacted the uh, a Lyric Opera of Chicago, they, they could think of a way to do that. I think it was connected to performance though, but they were able, I think post COVID because of the the new set of rules we have with COVID because all the unions don't want that to happen but they right. had kind of special dispensation that they were able to get put some out and um put some out there uh but you know I think one of the things you um pointed to is something I, I think it would be great for you to chime in on too which is that like it makes me think about um the late Madeline Albright who I also at one point interviewed and performed talking about her diplomatic toolbox. And yeah. we have a certain toolbox through which we communicate. And everything in our toolbox is about attracting attention and, 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 and communicating. It's a nice way to put it, but it's it's about attracting attention, like peacocks, you know, have, you know, or when a bear stands up. Right. And you might know about that coming. I do. I do. <laughs> but um, so beauty, beauty. So here's a story. One of the stories uh, was a story of a woman who was a young woman driving to a laundromat with her toddler in the back. Sincere was his name. Her name is Yasmin. And someone randomly shot at the car, killed Sincere and injured her. That's a dark story. And in fact, very difficult for the singers. But the beauty of the music and the beauty of the voice of the woman singing, the mother, uh, based on my interview, of, of my, it was my interview in music, and the beauty of the staging. You people were riveted. And so the very things that we might want to turn away from, we have an opportunity. Well, some people want to. Um, Peter Sellers asked him to direct something of mine. And he said, well, you know, I think Anna, you want to keep people in the theater. I don't mind if they leave. I mean, you and I have a common memory, but we want people to stay. <laughs> and so we do things and you know about those things. So I'm asking you to talk about them. You know, we do things to hold people's attention. Right. The news does it with all their fancy swishes and zooms and, you know, very quaffed um, groomed people. But I don't think that goes right straight through you the way the tools we have go right straight through. I mean, why don't you say something about it? I don't want to dwell talk. Well, you know, it's interesting. I just saw uh, Blue here, which is uh, written by Taswell Thompson and uh, Janine Chisori has, has written, has, is the composer on it. And it is about gun violence as well. And that is exactly how they were able to rivet the audience is because of the absolute stark beauty of this production and the kind of music that was utilized. So there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Now I wonder how many of those audience members will take those ideas outside and into their lives. I don't know. Well, that's the that's always the problem, right? That's the hardest part. And I think, um, you know, uh, look, I mean, you know that I had an institute at Harvard for three summers just to answer that question. Yeah. And I don't know that we can, right? I mean, you know, as a leader of an arts organization, the arena for now, was it 27 years or more? 30 25. years? 25 years that I'm sure your board members, your funders, I'm sure that people use that I word with you all the time. What's the impact? What's the impact? And there is a mystery. We don't know, you know? I mean, we don't know. I, I, I was 
you know, for me, it meant so much, for example, that Chicago Credit is such an amazing organization that people came to rehearsals to think about therap the, a therapist and another uh, coach, life coach came to rehearsals to see if they felt Yasmin Miller could see this story about what happened. So they came to prepare her. Wow. And I just also want to say one of the things that shocked me is after the, you know, after it was, they saw it the first time, the therapist leaned over and said, well, you know, the person I'm most concerned about is Miss Rochelle, who works at Chicago Cred, she said, because she taught that baby to walk. So it wasn't just how it affected the mother, how it would affect the mother, but how it would affect the whole community. And Arnie told me that Yasmin called him the night she was there opening night and said, you know, they baby, they kept my baby's name alive. And so, you know, we're thrilled when we know we've done something of use. That's all I need to hear. But other kinds of folks want to know, well, how would you bring that to scale? So there's words like impact and scale that I'm sure as a leader of an institution, you've thought about more than me. But how do you deal with the fact that there is a mystery and there should be a mystery about what we're doing. How do we know that it's, we're going to do more than get a standing ovation or fill the yeah. yeah, you know, it's funny. I always think of the fact that we have the ability to be able to brand people so that maybe in the middle of the night when they woke up, when they wake up, there may be a series of images that come back to them or in the middle of a fight with, with their husband or wife when they wake up in the middle of the night and suddenly part of the play will come back to them, that that may be the greatest gift that we can have. Because I always think that theater's a church, the opera house is a church. It's a, it's a place to be able to not just preach, but also deeply understand and meditate because where else do we go where we sit in the dark for a couple hours, right? And just actually listen to someone else talk to us. So I guess that's my greatest hope when you talk about impact. I think of it more that it's a moment of being, uh, you know, our souls get branded or they get etched. Somebody probably got etched by your story, Anna, and they're going to remember it in one way or another. But I don't know what the point. Do we know that they'll then go do something, right? Yeah. Will, they, will they contribute to Chicago Craig? Um, you know, will they do anything about it? And I, 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 I'm at the point in my career where I try. I'm very interested in not over promising. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm interested in not over promising at all, and so I tend to be a little. I, I don't like to make big statements about what we do. Yeah. Well, it's too, it's, it's too hard because the main thing is we don't know. So then you, you go into the unknown. Really interesting question just came in the chat, which is, can you talk about a time in your career when you were not succeeding? And what did you do about it? Yesterday. Today. <laughs> I'm on a deadline that just won't get done. And it's not that I have writer's block. It's that it's just really, really hard to get a grip on the story. And because I don't have that piece in, I'm late on something else where they have no sense of humor about the fact that it's late. <laughs> Today and last week, I have felt like a complete and utter failure. So I don't think like success is a static thing. <laughs> So like right now, I don't feel successful at all. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the truth. And so, I mean, I don't even know if that's what's about that question. I would say it's about, I think the question is about, um, you know, how to prepare yourself to be resilient, uh, whether it's at the beginning of your career or in the middle of your career. Uh, I mean, again, I'll set, send it back to you, Molly. I mean, you know, you built a whole new building and there must have been challenges while you were doing that, right? And must have been days where you thought, why did I think this was a good idea? Well, it was more than that. It was, oh my God, we're going to fail. Right. We're going to fail. Or waking up in the middle of the night saying, what, 
what are we going to do? And then there was something in the universe that would give another idea or I would reach out to somebody else and use my resources in a different way. And by resources, I mean people, because it's always through people that you get things done. And suddenly another idea would come and the wheels would start to spin and we'd be able to do it. But, you know, the only way you can really do that is by putting your own feet into the fire and staying there. And I think that's sometimes what young people don't understand is that to do something big, you, it actually takes a long time. It's not a short time. It's not a flash in the pan. It's not one and done. It is always a set of incremental moments and turning points. And quite frankly, that's the pleasure of it. That's the joy of it. That's the process of it. Um, and unless you're in it for that kind of a long haul, it's pretty hard to do anything. I mean, I, I don't like to fail. I don't know anybody that likes to fail. But I like what failure does for me, which is it causes me to look at the failure and try and figure out what did I do? What didn't I see? What could I see more fully the next time? How can I change my mind? How can I use another part of myself creatively to get this done? So I'm curious, Anna, when you look back at your career, what do you wish you would have been taught in school that they didn't teach you? Boy, you know, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot they did not teach me. And um, a lot, I mean, so much so that uh, I'm credited with creating a new form of theater because of all the things they weren't teaching me. <laughs> and that was so obvious that I was not learning. And by that, I just mean questions I had that they weren't interested in answering because I didn't go to school to be successful or to be a movie star or anything like that. When I went to acting school, it was a fluke and I had thought I wanted to do something uh, for social change and I saw people changing in front of me. So I thought, I'm just gonna study this thing, you know, actors changing into characters. Mm -hmm. And so I always had a very uh, sort of academic or pursuit of understanding the form. And that's also why I then became a teacher because you know, the classroom, you can't market process. The classroom is one of the few places. And I've said this already with Amy and the students at American University. It, you must cherish this because you cannot be in process very much afterwards. It will be very difficult to find places where you can do that. And so this, this is the time to take a risk and put your feet in the fire and fail, right? So that you right. can learn about yourself, particularly a school like American University that is uh, creating our, our leadership force that's gonna be, that they're gonna be the leaders, right? So there was so much that they were not, that I was not learning. And also, um, you know, in that era, I was the only black person in my class. Um, there weren't very many uh, black people to be found anywhere in San Francisco. So, you know, I had to deal too with this sense that becomes very, people talk about a lot now, you know, a sense of belonging. I had to create my own belongingness. And so, um, so I would say there was so much they weren't teaching me. I think and 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 I I felt like my feet were in the fire a lot there. So I had to be very 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 brave, I would say. Uh, and you know I think there's stuff that you don't learn if you don't have resources, right? That I had to learn about. That it's not any school's fault, but you know only thing I knew about money was how to try to make my paltry bank account get a little bit bigger every week so that I could move to New York, right? So I would say that I, I didn't expect anybody to teach me anything in a way, Molly. And when I look back now, I'm pleased about what I did learn then. And then I was, for the rest of my career, often in situations where I was just on my own to figure it out. You know, teaching is not a, it's right. not a big jolly thing. You're in that classroom alone with a bunch of people. When you're a young professor, you get overworked. I knew nothing about the tenure track. Um, if it hadn't have been for friends of mine 
uh, who I did, I made new friends at USC, which was not a good experience, but they got me through. And a wonderful woman who became the president of Brown University, uh, uh, Ruth Simmons. I mean, there were these wonderful women in particular mm -hmm. who just saw that I did not know what this thing called the university structure was because I didn't have a PhD. You know, I hadn't gone through the ranks. Right. I had an MFA. They saw that I was being slapped around in a really, really bad way. And they just, they helped me. And so I, I think I'm just answering your questions by saying, I don't think I really reflect on what I, they didn't teach me because I'm used to having to get the resources while I'm learning it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have a political mind. Do you know what I mean? Uh, to this day, I don't really know. I don't, I don't, I don't have any gossip uh, in general. That's not my personality. I'm, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know what's behind the scene in institutions. I never have that information. And you do need to know that. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's so interesting. I, I don't know that I learned very much in universities or in high schools or in colleges. I, I don't know that I did. I don't think I was a particularly good student. And I think what I did know is what I wanted to create. Because when I was 19, I wanted to create a theater in Alaska. So what I did is I ran around to all these different theaters to find out Teach me how to do the box office. Teach me how to hang lights. Teach me how to do this. So I think my way of learning has always been very much in action. And that's the way I've learned. I've learned by doing as opposed to by studying. Well, I and think we're the same in that way, right? Yeah, I, th I think we But if I recall correctly, dim in my mind, dim in my mind, your mother was a part of that, didn't you? or you and your mother do something amazing, like make food for the whole city? Or, I mean, didn't you do something like well, well, entrepreneurial? My, my mother and I fleeced my grandmother for $12,000 to start my theater in Alaska. So I'd say that's one thing we did. <laughs> but, but she knew, like she knew we played a back. I feel it was something when you were a child that oh, probably I recall. Well, my mother was incredible. She was a social worker. Yeah. So that's probably what you that's probably what you remember. Yeah. But I mean that that kind of action that we're both talking about, that's how you get the ahas. Because someone just asked me a question in growing from failure, how can we help others, employers, see failure as part of gr growth? How do you encourage that with those you mentor? Well, I think with those you mentor, you just let them know when they fail and come in and talk to you about it, that what did you learn? What's next? I mean, you know, a lot of people are, are punitive with people when they fail or it turns into blame or it turns into shame. And uh, that's, that's horrifying. That, that doesn't change anybody. And that, that's the road to least success is doing that. And quite frankly, I, I've always thought of it as failing up. I need to fail before I can succeed. And so that's why I find at least a modicum of joy in, uh, in, fail, in failing. And how do you help employers see failure as a part of growth? You know, I'm leaving uh, Arena after being there for 25 years. And I've been talking to the board and the community about whoever's a new artistic director, allow them to fail. Allow them, help them succeed and allow them to try things that don't work rather than turning on them in one form or another. And people are kind of going, they can oh, the, you. Huh? They, can never, they can never be you. No, and, and they, they never will, will be. be. And they never will be. And no more than you were Doug or Zelda. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we're all we're all different human beings. So to answer the person's question, I think we need to um, talk about failure as a natural outgrowth of success. <laughs> so that it's seen, you know, turn that turn the equation around somehow for people. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, Anna, that that you really have been someone who has 
learned through action as well that you've learned through doing as well and you have you've created a whole new forms because the forms that were there didn't interest you right no they didn't to be <laughs> I mean, they did. it's not entirely fair to say that there were things that did interest me but i was most i was interested in one particular part of what uh the world was in the in the dramatic imagination, and that was um, language and identity. I was particularly interested in that, you know. And I had studied languages before and thought that I wanted to be a linguist and stuff. So, I, it's it's not it's really just that I glommed on to what I was interested in and I just pursued that right. So yeah, that I mean I wasn't that interested in things that you know frankly would have been more lucrative. <laughs> well, when you think of that more lucrative, someone asks a question, tell me the way that your career is multifaceted. How does your career connect to areas that are outside of the arts? Um, well, even inside of the arts, you know, my, my agents always have to, to the extent that they even put up with me about this, they kind of have to pull me screaming and kicking to like take a job in television or movies, but those are the jobs that pay money. And if I walk down the street, people don't know. They don't know about let me down easy. They know about, you know, Mrs. Acolytus on uh, Nurse Jackie or the West Wing when I was on the West Wing. That's what they know. So, um, you know, I would be wiser if I had cultivated that stuff that that I didn't. But that wasn't your question. What was your what, so so inside of the arts? I yeah. have a yeah. very multifaceted thing and. Right going on and and I'm still teaching I've been teaching since 1973 I, um this weekend will be my classes last classes uh of the uh, for the semester and you know so I'm still teaching uh and but it's related to art it's not like I'm teaching chemistry or something right 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 and as you uh as you work and think about what's happening now in American theater I'm curious about what's giving you hope and what's causing you concern and what is the most exciting changes uh, that you've seen recently in uh, theater in the United States? Well, I'm, I'm very concerned about two things that, um, you know, I'm, I'd be, have to be careful how I say it. I'm, I'm concerned about, I, well, let me put it this way. I want to understand more about what has happened outside of the world of performance that has caused uh, actors in particular to fear carrying large emotions. And um, this is something that I also was trying to start a conversation about at American University. What has happened? What are the pressures from outside of where we are that make it frightening for people in the rehearsal hall in an art form which is about dialogue and conflict to express the temporary truth of how they feel about those things right so i'm very very concerned about that mm -hmm. and i'm concerned about the audience because before that happened to us you know, we started to see what we call trigger warnings in any place where we saw art. And you certainly, again, know more about that as a leader than I do. And I was very surprised when um, Twilight, the last performance of Twilight in New York, one of the characters in Twilight came to be on, have on stage conversation with me, Cornell West. And uh, a woman raised her hand in the audience. Turned out she was actually a student of Cornell's at Union Theological Seminary. And she said, I want to know how there's so much trauma in, your, in this work. How did you take care of yourself? I'm used to hearing that question. You've probably heard people ask me. Yep. That. How did you take care of the actors? I thought that was an interesting question. And, you know, of course, we did do that. Uh, and then lastly, she said, how do you take care of the audience? Because it was painful for me to be in this audience under the gaze of white people in this audience. So, I mean, what I'm saying is you're very familiar with all of this. 
which has to do with fear and it has to do with pain and how people think about themselves in relationship to it. So what I'm saying is I want to know what the outside forces are because we should be the ones, we say we are the ones who are shedding light on the human condition. And that doesn't just mean the happy human condition. And of course, some of our greatest dramas in every cultural uh, genre are dramas about tragic, tragic, I won't even use the word trauma because I think we overuse it, tragic, tragic, series of the human soul that's why it's called drama we are supposed to so we're the ones supposed to carry that right and it i hope you hear this molly not as a critique and that the the people listening in here not as a critique but a i want to know what it is because i don't think it's just from us i think it's a pressure on coming from in society in general and we are collapsing under the weight of that. Yeah, it's very interesting uh, to me, this conversation, because we've had it a lot at Arena, too. As people have said, you know, this story uh, has so much intensity in it and so much for us to, uh, to fear in it. And so I, I sat down and I just started making a, a list of uh, plays that have trauma in them, because I'm going to have to use that word. And uh, most everything Tennessee Williams wrote, most everything August Wilson wrote, most everything that uh, Eugene O'Dea wrote, uh, the Greeks gouging your eyes out. I mean, it's that is drama. That is partly our purpose is actually to go in and excavate that, shine a light on it so that audiences can experience it and leave somehow refreshed because it's someone else on stage who is carrying that. It's not us. And it's someone who is an actor and is a chameleon and actually wants to carry that. That's actually their gift. Their gift is their ability to become someone who takes on that kind of story. So um, this whole conversation has been really, really interesting to me about how do you take care of everybody? Well, at a certain point, it would be a pretty dry theater if there was not uh, friction and the dynamic of uh, death and fear and having one's back against the wall and having to fight your way out. I mean, that's what drama is. That's what theater is. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to, um, you know, and this has to do too with support. People say, oh, in Europe, there's support and there should be more support here. But as you know very well, there is a way that we're always earning our place. Right. We're always earning our place. It is not given. And I feel part of that place is exactly what you just said, is that we're carrying this for the benefit of the audience and that we're doing it in a way that is not therapy. It's not right. pathology. We're not calling anybody anything. We're not judging anybody. We can't because, you know, when you carry it, you have to love it. You know, we're not high and mighty about it and saying we know the answer. We're presenting it in a way that in success, someone in the audience can, can feel the reach of it and themselves either feel less lonely or more consolation or with Let Me Down Easy, I can't tell you how many times people came up to me and said, this play helped me so much with my the death of my mother. That's they right back over the death of my mother or the death of my, uh, you know, father. And, you know, we wouldn't even say that the play was about death. We said it was about, you know, the, 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 I uh, know, not about you, but transitions. Anyway, it was about the, uh, the resilience of the soul and the, whatever we said, we didn't say it was about death. Nobody would come. Right. 
But in fact, it meant so much to people because it did touch them in that place that had to do with death, fear of death, uh, near misses with it, helping someone who had a near miss. So, so yeah, uh, I just, um, that's what we should, we, that's what I feel what we're earning our place to do. It would be great if, I don't know about you, I don't have a patron who's just got written me this one big check um, to say, you know, this is for you for the rest of your life, do as you wish. Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, and so we do, we, we earn our place. And I think that's one way we earn it. In addition to being really funny, or, you know, making something really beautiful or being really beautiful or being able to leap really high. I mean, right. All of that. We right. are entertainers, too. Right. Right. You know, we're doing a production of Angels in America right now. And uh, Janos Saz, who's a great Hungarian director, is directing it. And it's a fever dream. And uh, it's some of the back, best acting that I've seen in years that is playing out on the stage right now. And some of the most difficult roles, right? Uh, and the actors absolutely love it. And so does the audience. Because the audiences are invested in the story and in going through the story. I've had a number of gay men that want, haven't wanted to see it. Oh, really? and I can't go back and see that time again. I didn't see the play then. I can't see it now. And then a number of them have come in and just said, oh, my God, you know, he is a great writer. Um, but without the ability to show the angels in America, then you don't have the ability to show a POTUS, which is going to make us all laugh and fall out of the chairs. Exactly what you're saying. This range that we have in the American theater is so exciting. I think the problem is when one gets stuck on only part of the range and keeps playing that same narrow section over and over again. And that's when audiences feel like they're being banged over the head by it. I think that's, I think that's the difference. And because we've been in COVID land for two years, two and a half years, almost three years, in one way or another, the, all, the whole theater world really turned inward on itself mm -hmm. and looked at everything from pay scales to we see you white American theater to the hashtag me too movement. To, I mean, we could just go on and on and on. And I think we're in the middle of a new revolution because of that. And I also fear that what's happening is a lot of people are eating each other up within the theater ecology over all these things, whether it has to do with race, whether it has to do with rich versus poor, uh, whether it's young versus old. And instead of turning that out, back out to society, because that's what's going on in society, are acting that out internally within organizations. And that's one of the things that I fear on it right now. But I think in a way we're, we're saying the same, we're, 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 what we're saying are cousins to each other, which is yes. that my fear is about uh, uh, a trepidation about uh, emotions and a trepidation about ideas. And I think it's the same, same thing that, I'm, that it's, it is coming from the outside and we should be turning that out rather than just absorbing that as our norm. That's the norm outside. And if we, do, if we can resist absorbing it as our norm, yeah. we can be helpful. We can be helpful. We can try to encourage people to be courageous, right? And forgiving and give people the benefit of the doubt and all of these things. I mean, you're in Washington, so you, you also feel it very much. I, I, but I hope that there is a true revolution in the theater because you know, in my lifetime, what I've seen is that the window opens, everybody gets really excited, but it does close. Yeah. And we go back to certain things that are the norm. I'm very proud that I was able to come around in the time of George Wolf, Tony Kushner, Susan Laurie Parks, 
August was like a, a few years ahead of us and stuff like that, which really we all were a part of changing the canon. And it was just so great that even if you didn't know these people to go see their work and go, oh, we're breaking from the norm. That's right. Right, right. And so I'm very interested to see what what's what what's out there right now in 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 that way. And so there's inevitably a revolution, but it's like when you go to the symphony and there's some fantastic new composer and you just watch people just go thank the audience just go thank god the last piece is Beethoven you, know? <laughs> you can feel the sigh like that they have to put up with this new classical music but new classical music is 40 or 50 years old by now right that's right that's right yeah so as as an artist where do you feel um new longings new discoveries coming up for you as an artist What's well the, the big I, well the opera was certainly yeah, that's um, huge that was huge in so many ways um uh well you know i made a choice that with notes from the field i wanted to write for other people and take commissions and so um what i'm most excited about is you know i have say with the opera, you know, watching those singers embody this music and the libretto. And I have a play about Billie Jean King, which will go to La Jolla in May in rehearsal. And just being in auditions and watching, you know, all of these people come in, uh, trying to make sense of the words, um, doing a great job of it. And also uh, a play about Ella Fitzgerald. So I am, I've changed my position. I'm not we're making only my own work anymore. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see if I can, we'll see if I fail or uh, totally, or if there are scraps or how I feel about that as I try this brand new way of being. Well, in this brand new way of being, how did you write the piece on Billie Jean King? Same way I do, I have well, lots of reading about her. Okay. So luckily, Billie Jean King has written four or autobiographies. Uh, this is obviously a woman who likes to tell the, the story. Um, so there's plenty of, of stuff out there about her, about the other people around her, uh, and focusing in particular on what she and a group of women did to change women's tennis forever and to change tennis forever. And uh, you will love this play because uh, and I got to know her and her wife very well. And they're just wonderful, wonderful, encouraging people. Uh, even though, you know, they have a constant critique, but they're wonderfully, wonderfully uh, supportive people. And the magical, the magical reality that Billie Jean King, there were so many, talk about failure or talk about, there were so many people in the status quo who challenged her. And now there's the entire center is named after her. This entire center, you know, that represents the USTA. And these are the people from the time she was a little girl who were telling her she couldn't do it. Wow. That's great. So that's her legacy. What is your legacy? That makes me feel old, Molly. I don't know. I don't even know how to think about that. Um, you know, I think in part, Molly, because deep down, and this doesn't sound very thrilling, I, I think deep down, I'm a teacher. And so I think it's hard for me to see beyond that in terms of legacy. I'm very happy that one of my mentees just got a great big grant uh, and, you know, foundations for the longest time would not fund individuals. I'm proud that I argued a lot about that with people who had power in foundations. I'm pleased that he's got a big grant. Um, and um, so I, I hope that my, my outside position, uh, I would say, I hope that my outside position has encouraged people to also make their own path 
and not dwell too much on the sense that they don't belong. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. I mean, 50 years as a teacher is legacy. I mean, your students are your legacy, right? I don't know. You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. And also because I don't do it full time. You know what I mean? I think if I were some, I don't do it full time. I only right. do it a year, um, stuff like that. And I don't teach just uh, actors. You know, I don't think I've consolidated that enough to be like Zelda, for example. Right. Now, Zelda right. has a legacy. She has a legacy as a pioneer in the theater. Right. She has a legacy as a teacher. That's so right. She was doing those two things. Whereas I've right. done, I think it's harder to have a legacy when you've just done this mosaic as I have. What's right. your legacy? Oh, I mean, hard to say. There's probably two or three areas for me. Uh, one is uh, the creation of Arena Stage at the Mead Center for American Theater, of actually focusing this theater on American plays, American voices, and American ideas. That's a legacy. Um, the power play cycle, the 25 plays, 25 um decades of american history that's that's part of the legacy and i would say um oh look at this thank you so much for joining us anna congratulations on your recent appointment to president biden's arts and humanities committee that's so fantastic that's going to be great that's going to be great when you were our age did you know what you wanted to do or what path you wanted to take career-wise is it okay if you don't know quite yet, or are you still trying to navigate what you're passionate about? Um, well, I, it wasn't concrete. You know, I, as I say, I had a question and I think that you, you know, college, university should be about finding your questions, not your answers. So I had a big, big question, which was, what is the relationship of language to identity? And um, I was more concerned about investigating that than having a career. Uh, and in fact, the time that I was able to get the most headway on that was a time that I decided, much to everybody's shock, to leave a tenure track position, the first one I had at Carnegie Mellon, a fantastic university, to leave and go to New York and walk dogs. And, um, you know, and I was able to really, in that time of, of just walking dogs and having temp jobs, and not having work I had to take home at night or wake up in the middle of the night worried about, you know, students and so forth, that I created what I do. And then the next time that I was able to, you know, really burrow down on it was um, when I um, had a Bunting Fellowship and I didn't have to go to work every day. And uh, I created Fires of the Mirror, which although it wasn't the first of my works, it was the 13th is really put my work on the map. So I would say I didn't have an idea about a career, to be perfectly honest. I had a question and that that's really the truth. That's all I had. Anna, how did you get over your fear of moving from something like a tenured profession into walking dogs? I wasn't afraid of that at you all. You just weren't afraid. You, were you afraid not you know, to? I was 20, how old was I, 27? Um, I wasn't afraid. I mean, look, and it hadn't been that long ago. I was 21 when I had $80 in an overnight bag and I left Baltimore with some friends and drove across country and made a promise. All I had was a promise. I will not ask my parents for another dime because I felt they'd done enough helping me get through college. And so that was my promise. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a career. I had that promise. And then when I ended up in acting school, I came out with a question. And so, you know, again, in reflection, I think it would be better if I had been career focused, but I haven't been. And I, so I was not at all afraid to leave Carnegie Mellon. I mean, I remember the chairman of the department sitting me down and saying, what are you doing? You're, you're a woman, you're black, you're an actor. This is a tenure track position. Do you know how long it will be before that will come around for you again? And you said it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I didn't say that. It was very, very polite. I'm not sure what I did. I probably curtsied and left. I probably said, thank you so much, Walter, and curtsied and left. I was very polite. I know it might be hard to believe. I was very, very Baltimore gracious. Very, very. 
you know, I was just a kid when I decided I wanted to start a theater in Alaska. I was 19. I was over in Europe with a backpack on. Then I spent the next seven years figuring it out. So I think I've, I've got the kind of personality that goes, I've got a purpose and I just, everybody thinks I'm nutty around me because I'm so focused. And but I, but I think what you've just said in terms of the, the uh, not just the young people, but everybody listening in is maybe, maybe it's just more important to think like, what's my purpose than what's my career? Yeah, totally. What, what's my purpose? Totally. Totally. And it, um, it's not about the box of that career. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, yeah. Right. I, I didn't ever think about a career. It was, I was passionate about theater and I wanted to start a theater company and I wanted to direct. And at that time, women were not being allowed to direct. You couldn't, you couldn't get a directing job to save your life. And how many women directors were there in Alaska for you to model yourself after? None. None. No role models, right? It was me. Yeah. Um, someone just said in a career where you're working with so many different types of people with different artistic styles, how do you navigate all of these working relationships, which I'm sure can be challenging? Well, I feel, you know, in a way it works the best when I'm in a situation where I'm learning, like with the opera, you know, yeah. that I so much to learn. And um, also, and I brought this up with Amy yesterday, I think it was really important that Yuval, the disruptor, the, 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 the new disrupt operator, this dis, new dis, disruptor is 42. And we were like this, like this. I think cross-generational relationships are really, really important. Yeah. And I don't think he ever asked me for any wisdom. It's not, I didn't, I, I was so happy I didn't have that role. I don't like that role when people think I'm wise. Not at all, not at all. No deference, right? Not at all, but just that, I think, I just think there's a lot of promise in that, right? So, yeah. and when I go to Hollywood, um, I mean, it's just a whole different thing. And, you know, again, you figure out that it's really important to do what they tell you to do. You know, I've worked luckily in places that have no asshole policies. And that's very different than when I do my own work. If I do my own work, I can't afford to have everybody just tell me what to do. It'll be a disaster because they don't know what I'm doing. I'm the one who created this way of working, right? So I've been able to create cultures of work. And that's important for people out there who are thinking of doing something differently. You have to, you, you're never gonna be alone and you very may, well may have to organize in a way outside, in my case, outside of an institution, a culture of, of who's needed to do the work, right? And you know, you make your own hierarchies in terms of that. And in my case, they're not, traditional hierarchies of, of who's the closest person to me, uh, uh, who do I trust the most, you know, it's, it's not the norm, right? Uh, and in fact, it shows up in their pay and I have to, I supplement the pay of the people who on an org chart would be considered maybe the least important or the most important to me. So you have to, you have to make your own org chart very often, I would say. Uh -huh. Don't you think, I mean, even you, we hear you walk into a theater, you didn't just take the org chart that was there, right? No, I tried to flatten it. You know, when I realized that I was gonna be leaving Arena about a year and a half ago, I went back to throwing pots again. I went back to pottery again, cool. which is something I'd done 50 years ago. I, I mean, in my mind, it was in the kitchen, you're throwing pots and pans. But <laughs> in a pottery studio. Yeah. And it, you know, it's made me so happy because it's taken me back to beginner's mind where I'm not an expert. I get to learn everything anew, still carrying with it my director's eye, which can take me further than somebody else who's never done any kind of an art form. But I love that ability to be able to mix it up and try something entirely different and stumble and fall and then learn again. I mean, it's it's a great joy. So I would say to all of you out there, if you ever get to that point where you get scared to death, try something entirely different 
and see how it shakes you up. Just like Anna has done with opera or I did with pottery because it changes you and then it enriches your life in a whole different way. You know, and I, I know we're coming into our time that reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, we'd had these workshops of the opera. Opera is a long way out, right? It's all this stuff, a lot of resources. You wouldn't even want to know. <laughs> I can't imagine what the budget was, but only five performances. Woo, that's an economic model. Um, but, uh, you know, on the first day of the actual real rehearsal, when we were going into rehearsal and the children's choir showed up, this huge, all these people walking in the room and all of the singers and, and, and the whole people from the, you know, the, the administrative people and me and the composer and the director all, um, you know, said words. And I said, you know, if this were the first day of a play, I'd be terrified. And I said, I'm so happy. I feel like a kid on Christmas morning and I'm not scared at all because I don't know what to be afraid of. <laughs> Everybody laughed because they were afraid, right? But yeah, I didn't, that's the one thing too about when you really step out yep. of your comfort zone. The fact is you don't even know what to be afraid of. Yep, I love it. I love it. Well, great advice from Anna DeVere Smith. And Ava is saying that um, we're at time now because I think there's something that she wants to talk about. Thanks for a great, great conversation, Anna. Oh, thank you. It's so great to see you. And I hope I see you in person before your actual last day. Yeah, well, let's do it. Let's we'll keep in touch in some kind of way. I must at least raise a toast to you, Molly, for everything that you've done, uh, not just for the arena, not just for Alaska, not just for Washington, but what you've done for world theater. And I feel so privileged to have actually had a chance to work at Arena while you were uh, the artistic director. Thank you, Anna. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much to you both for joining us today. Thank you to the Alumni Association for co-sponsoring with us. For any uh, students who are on the call, uh, we have so much wonderful information from the Alumni Association to share with you. I'll just share a little bit of it before everyone logs off. Um, we have some really fabulous alumni programs here at American University. Uh, you can get in touch with alumni um, as a student if you want. You have We have the option to have dinner with alumni, to join the Student Alumni Association, or sign up for Alumni Fire. If you are a soon-to-be alum or an alum already like myself and like Molly, uh, you can stay connected a couple ways. There are local alumni associations in every major city. Um, the DC one is particularly fabulous, if I may say, and using these organizations that are on the screen now. Uh, we have wonderful interest groups as well for you to take part in if that's something that interests you. Um, Thank you all so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to SIGN or to the Alumni Association. Thank you again, Molly, for joining us. And we hope to see you all at our next career conversation. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.